tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We are intending this circuit breaker to save lives. We have thrown everything in but the kitchen sink. BC tightens restrictions even further in the north to try to stop the spread of COVID-19. Also, we have no evidence to demonstrate there was an occurrence associated with railway operations. The TSB says it found no link between train activity and the fire that wiped out Lytton. Very disappointed. I feel that it wasn't thorough investigation. The doubts and what happens next. I'm so proud to be South Asian and I wouldn't want to be part of any other culture. And how a local artist is reimagining her teenage bedroom. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. Anita is off tonight. Significant changes are coming from most of northern BC. Health officials are imposing even tighter measures to try to stop the spread of COVID-19. Let's bring in our John Hernandez now. John, how serious is this? Yeah, so Minister Dix painted a very grim picture of the Northern Health region. It's currently seeing the highest rate of COVID-19 transmission in the province. Critical care beds are beyond maximum capacity. To paint a picture of how overwhelmed hospitals are, 58 people who were hospitalized have been flown out of the region, most of them in critical condition because of COVID-19. This is why the province is now imposing what it calls a circuit breaker. We are all in. We, we have thrown everything in but the kitchen sink, and the kitchen sink went in a week ago. We are doing everything we can to support the North, and we will continue to do that. But we also need to ask people in the North to do more. So here's exactly what people in the area will need to do starting at midnight tonight. Uh, indoor and outdoor gatherings will be restricted to fully vaccinated people. Outdoor gatherings will be capped at 25 people. Organized events like weddings must have a COVID-19 safety plan with mandatory masks. Worship services, I'm sorry, uh, worship services will go virtual. Restaurants will continue indoor dining, but alcohol service will end at 10 p.m. Bars and nightclubs will be closed unless they are serving a full meal with alcohol services. Now, these restrictions will be in place until November 19th. It's important to note this won't apply to communities west of Kitwanga, which includes Terrace, Kitimat, and Haida Gwaii. John, it still includes a huge swath of this province. How did we get here? Yeah, as we've been hearing over the last number of weeks, parts of Northern Health have been lagging in terms of vaccination rates. In northeastern BC in particular, just 55% of eligible residents are fully vaccinated. This has led to a new case rate that's about four times higher than other parts of BC. Dr. Bonnie Henry says many young people are suffering from severe health effects. In fact, today, a man in his 20s died. That's why they're urging everyone to follow these new rules. These are not orders to be gained or to be got around to try and float the rules because you think they don't apply to you. These are your community members. These are your family members. These are our family members who are being affected. Henry said the province will be stepping up enforcement in the area as well. John Hernandez reporting live. Thanks very much. Thank you. Justin McElroy has been tracking the BC COVID numbers for us closely. Justin, how bad is the situation in the north right now? Uh, it's about three to ten times worse than the rest of the province in terms of major population areas, Dan. And the reason we can say that is if we look at per capita case numbers in September. Now, you look at those red bars right there, those are health regions in northern BC, Quinell, Prince George, and the Peace region. And you can see more than one percent of the population got infected last month. You look at the rest of the province, though, major urban areas, it's much, much less than that, between 100 and 730 cases. So that's that huge discretion. And then if you look at vaccine rates, it's the exact opposite story, where all of those regions in the north are now at the bottom, between 53 and 75 percent fully vaccinated, versus the rest of the province, 79 percent for Kelowna, but then 85 percent for Surrey, 89 percent for downtown Vancouver and Victoria and North Vancouver. It's pretty stable. If you have high vaccine rates, you're going to have a lower number of case counts, and especially in the north, where there are less hospitals, it's causing a huge strain on resources right now. 
Yes, and now for the rest of BC, what's the overall picture we're seeing? Well, and that's just it, because when you look at what's happening BC-wide right now, here's our main chart that we've looked at a few times. The yellow line is uh, the rolling average of cases, and if you see how it's going down right now, along with the red line for active cases, the rolling average is about 25% lower just in the last two weeks. We are seeing sustained decreased transmission in most of the province now. Now, that hasn't shown up in hospitalizations yet, because that's a lagging indicator however it shows that what is in place right now is doing a decent job at reducing the numbers everywhere but northern BC where their vaccine rates are much lower than the rest of the province and where we're seeing those increased restrictions Justin McElroy thanks very much the lower infection rates in Vancouver coastal and island health authorities are in big contrast to the high numbers across the north in BC there were 580 new cases today Sadly, nine more people have died. We've now lost 2,042 people so far. 378 people are in hospital in BC right now. 153 of those patients are in ICU. Now, amid this sometimes Herculean effort to get British Columbians immunized against COVID-19, there is the hurdle of vaccine hesitancy. But the BC government's vaccine card program appears to have nudged thousands of people to finally get their shots. As Bell Puri explains, the rush to meet last month's deadline for the cards generated a vaccination boom. Vaccine holdouts make up most of the line outside a clinic for COVID shots. It's my first shots. It will be my first shots. There is all kinds of weird stories out there. I'm hesitant. I don't like needles. Six months after vaccine registration opened in BC, something has alleviated that hesitancy. Seeing the uh, death rate go up again and people, a lot of people getting sick made me want to come in to get it. So I had a friend in Alberta, he was in a coma for three weeks and he just came out of it as a result from not getting the shot. So that scared me too. But I just been to my doctors there for some pills and uh, yeah, he said it's, it's quite safe. So uh, I'll take his word for it. I've been kind of leery all this time, though. Make sure you get medical attention. Vaccine hesitancy, according to experts, is all about a level of confidence in the medical system, convenience and complacency. I think that's where the vaccine passports come in, and I think they've been quite effective. You know, they've really addressed that group of individuals who was somewhat complacent about it. It's a policy that appears to have nudged individuals toward acceptance. There are multiple reasons why people are just now getting their first COVID vaccine. While many remain on the fence, the government required proof of vaccine did trigger an initial jump in the number of people heading to clinics. A look at the daily average of people asking for first shots shows in the month before the announcement, it was just under 4,300. In the month after the announcement, the daily rolling average peaked at almost 7,000. We saw a significant portion, about 60%, uh, was first doses. So at least every other person was there for a first dose. And the uptick includes more men than women. The number of 18 to 29-year-old men looking for a first-dose vaccination jumped almost 25%, compared to just over 20% for women. It wouldn't be truthful if I was saying it was just younger people. We do see some elderly individuals as well who, of course, had access to the vaccine many months ago. But predominantly, we would see uh, younger cohorts. Take a deep breath in. In recent weeks, though, first doses have slowed dramatically. But as the October 24th deadline for a mandatory two doses approaches, the go. demand for vaccine remains steady. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Months after that catastrophic fire that all but wiped out the village of Lytton, the Transportation Safety Board has finished its investigation. But as Renee Filipponi shows us, its findings have left more questions than answers for those most affected by that blaze. Community members took a moment to say thank you and goodbye to volunteers from out of town who spent months cleaning up the rubble. It takes a community to recover. But Linton First Nation Chief Janet Webster says she's disappointed after the Transportation Safety Board found there is no evidence that railway activity caused the fire. I feel that it wasn't a thorough investigation. Transportation Board came in nine days after the fire and a lot of uh, stuff was ruffled through. 
It was late June, in the middle of a record heat wave, when fire tore through the community, killing two people and leaving little behind. At the time, many locals speculated flying sparks from a train caused the blaze. Today, the TSB says they didn't find a connection and said their investigation is over. UC Wildfire Service and the RCMP are continuing to investigate, but unless we can link the Litton fire directly to a railway transportation occurrence, we really don't have further jurisdiction. I think for the, the people of Lytton, we, we need to have some kind of closure. This is all that's left behind of Denise O'Connor's home. She was hoping today would bring answers for her and others who have been left homeless and have no idea what their future holds. I'm still trying to figure out where I'm going to go, what, it, what it's going to look like for me, because, you know, we're not going, we're not going home anytime soon. Former firefighter Alfred Higginbottom took these videos that night and says he still thinks about the fire every day and worries it could happen again. If you don't have accountability, you're never going to learn from your mistakes or anyone's mistakes. It's ludicrous. This investigation may be over, but the Transportation Safety Board says it's taking a broader look at how extreme heat can increase the risk of fires started by trains. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now with our first look at the forecast. Joe, to say we're staring at a fire hose is a bit of an understatement. You said it, Dan. Yeah, it is not raining right now, and this is the last time it will not be raining in the next three days. It is uh, coming, the atmospheric river, and we've got those rainfall warnings in place. Let me start you off with the satellite and radar. Uh, we did see the heavier rain earlier today. This is a bit of a break, but the real event to kick in overnight tonight. But just to take you back, uh, this is a classic atmospheric river, a long plume of moisture uh, carried towards the south coast from across the Pacific. And yes, we are in the bullseye. In fact, Metro Vancouver up towards Howe Sound, the only ones under the rainfall warning, we will get the brunt of it Friday morning through Sunday morning, 150 millimeters, and some parts of the North Shore could see even more. Just to put that into perspective, October rainfall totals, or averages, I should say, around 186 millimeters. So we will well surpass our averages uh, in, in just the, uh, the weekend alone. Everyone else in white under the special weather statement, it's still going to be a soggy event for the South Coast in general. Add to that gusty winds and rising snow lines. We won't see snow on the locals with this event. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be up around 2,500 meters over the weekend. But look at this snapshot. This is just through to Saturday morning, and you can see the white dam that is already over 100 millimeter bullseye. So I'll take you through the next couple of days. I've managed to find some sunshine in the long range, and I will tell you more about it coming up. And we thank you. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. <laughs> A warning tonight from RCMP after three women were grabbed from behind in separate attacks in Surrey. The first incident happened September 22nd around 5 p.m. in Bear Creek Park. Later that evening, a second attack on Miller Road near River Road, I should say September 27th. And on October 10th, a woman was grabbed around midnight on a pathway between 132nd Street and Edinburgh Drive. Police have stepped up patrols in that area and are asking women to be extra careful. A 41-year-old man has died after a motorcycle crash in East Vancouver last night. The motorcycle rider, he was a, a Vancouver resident, a man uh, who's 41 years old, he died on scene. So there were uh, prolonged attempts to try to revive this man at the scene uh, by our paramedics, but unfortunately he died on the scene. It happened just before 7 p.m. Police say a bike collided with a white Mazda near 41st and Rupert Street. They say the 26-year-old driver of the car remained on the scene and is cooperating with them. Investigators don't think drugs or alcohol were involved. Anyone who witnessed this crash or may have dash cam footage is asked to contact police. The VPD are also looking for the driver of a dark-colored SUV who they say was involved in a hit-and-run earlier this week. Police believe the driver of a 2016 Mazda CX-5 hit a person who was crossing near East 41st and Fraser just before 6.30 Tuesday morning. That driver took off and the 30-year-old victim was left with life-threatening head injuries. Police are asking the driver to come forward and any witnesses to contact them as well. The new chief of the Assembly of First Nations was in downtown, in the downtown east side today. 
Roseanne Archibald says she's connecting with chiefs, councils, and community members throughout the province, looking at the impacts residential schools have on survivors and intergenerational survivors. This is ground zero for the fallout of those institutions. And so there are organizations that are here servicing First Nation citizens that do come to the city. And I really felt it was important to connect to them and understand what they're doing for First Nation citizens. Archibald says healing services for Indigenous people on the downtown east side are a vital part of the journey to reconciliation. Thousands of young people in government care across our province will soon be getting new phones to help them better keep connected to friends, family and online services. Our first priority for children and youth in care is to ensure they feel safe and supported to reach their goals. Our government is committed to providing resources to the youth we serve that their peers with more traditional family support often take for granted. Dean says access to smartphones can build self-esteem and a sense of belonging. The province will give 4,000 iPhones out over the next two months. More than 5,000 children and youth are in government care in BC. The ministry says that is the lowest number in 30 years. Imagine being back in your teenage bedroom. Feeling nostalgic or cringeworthy? Well, Vancouver visual artist Sandeep Johal is reclaiming her teenage years by reimagining her childhood space. South Asian role models now feature much more prominently, and her retrospective redesign is part of a new exhibit at the Surrey Art Gallery. CBC got a tour. Have a look. Hi, I'm Sandeep Johal. I'm a local visual artist and muralist, and I'm standing in the space where my new solo show, What If, is showing at Surrey Art Gallery. So essentially, we're looking at a loose recreation of my teenage bedroom and I'm revisiting and reimagining what it would have been like if I had grown up with access to South Asian female role models. Back in the 90s when the Spice Girls came out, I was like, ah, oh, they're so cool, they're like so empowered. And then, you know, later on you realize it was this sort of prefabricated band. I wanted to sort of recontextualize that and think of, well, who would my Spice Girls be if I could make my own sort of Spice Girls reference? And so I created a textile in the style of the poster and I chose five women from my series to be the Spice Girls. So it's Fulan Devi, India's bandit queen, Safaya Duleep Singh, who was a prominent suffragette, Lakshmi Bai, the Rani of Jhansi, who was um, a leading figure in the 1857 rebellion against the British. And then there's Sampat Pal Devi, who is the founder of the Glubby Gang, which is a vigilante group of women who kind of do old school justice. And then Jaya Bin Desai, the workers' rights activist. I was really looking for South Asian female trailblazers and pioneers and women who really showed a lot of resilience and perseverance in situations that we would find really oppressive or really difficult to move through and push through. I grew up in a small town in Kelowna in the Okanagan and uh, there was a very small South Asian population. You know, when you're looking at magazines and you're looking at pop culture and you don't see yourself, you don't see people who look like you and you don't really see that reflected in the people around you, it can feel very isolating. And I think as, as many first generation kids do, you kind of turn your back on your culture and you just try to conform and be like your friends. And there's, you know, in adulthood I felt a deep, a deep shame around those feelings that I had, those feelings of embarrassment and shame around my heritage because I'm so proud to be South Asian and I wouldn't want to be part of any other culture. I think our culture is very special. Very cool. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm Dan Bird, filling in for Anita Bath tonight and tomorrow. You can always watch our news program online on our free app, CBC Gem, and catch us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. A crisis in Canada's far north. The capital of Nunavut is facing serious water problems. How Iqaluit residents are coping and the cries for help after this. And thank you for staying with us during our commercial-free live stream tonight. PEI watershed groups are looking for help in their quest to find out more about bat populations on the island. As Nancy Russell reports, they're asking landowners who have abandoned wells if they'll offer them up as homes for bats. 
this abandoned well is just what the PEI Watershed Alliance is looking for, a potential place for bats to hibernate and spend the winter, similar to caves that provide habitat for bats in other parts of Canada. The Watershed Alliance has about half a dozen so far and is looking for more. Abandoned wells on PEI, so old wells that were built maybe a hundred years ago and have just kind of been forgotten about. There's a lot of them all over the island, we've heard. Ramos has spent the summer setting up these acoustic monitoring devices at 50 sites across the island, from Surrey to Tignish. Part of a three-year project trying to measure bat populations here on PEI, especially the little brown bat or brown myotis and the northern myotis. They're both actually endangered too, so it's really kind of important to know where they're hibernating, especially or if they're hibernating here on the island and just how many of them are really around and just kind of the areas that they like to hang out in. This watershed coordinator is happy to help. She says people in the area are becoming more interested in bats. The acoustic monitoring, she says, will help them know more about local bat populations. It tells us whether you know it's a, a perfect habitat and we can put more resources into into protecting that. Pelkey says she has a lead on another well in the area and is hoping to find more. She says people are eager to help the bats. It is nice that people are you know calling or mentioning hey I'm seeing bats. Um, it is something people are more interested in and um, if they're can help in any way, They're, they are trying to. Several other watershed groups have abandoned wells that they will monitor this fall. Ramos says they are hoping to have as many as possible across the island, giving the bats some new places to call home. Nancy Russell, CBC News, Panette. Thousands of litres of bottled water are being airlifted into a Iqaluit tonight. As the CBC's Juanita Taylor explains, the capital city of Nunavut is under a state of emergency because its water supply is contaminated. The first shipment of bottled water has arrived into Iqaluit today. It's the first of three shipments of this water that the Nunavut government has ordered for the residents of Iqaluit, totaling 80,000 litres. In the meantime, the city's water trucks have been getting their water from a nearby river and bringing it to a couple of stations around the city where people can fill up their jugs. What we are hearing is that some people are struggling to get that water. Some people just don't have the proper containers. Some people are using jerry cans, basically anything that they can find. Now, another issue we're hearing is people who don't have transportation to go and get the water is becoming an issue. So the city of Dechaluit is offering rides and offering ways for people to get that water. And especially in a tight-knit Inuit community like Dechaluit, people have been pulling together and helping one another out at this time. Now, we've also heard from a mother of five children. Her youngest is only a month old, and she's been getting headaches and that her baby seems to be crankier than normal. Now, she thought that her symptoms 
symptoms were stress related, but now that they know that the tap water has been contaminated with fuel, she's been second guessing where she might actually be getting those headaches from. What kind of symptoms are we going to have? What should we look for? There's no real information um, from the health or the city of what the side effects may be. She's also concerned about the amount of plastic that 80,000 liters of bottled water will produce in the capital city because there is no recycling depot in Akaluit, let alone in all of Nunavut. Now, two more aircraft are scheduled to deliver the remaining bottled water into Akaluit tomorrow. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Yellowknife. Per capita, Saskatchewan's COVID situation remains the worst in this country. Deaths and new cases are the highest in Canada. Hospitals and ICU beds are full. The system is on the brink. And with no new restrictions and no requests for outside help, Omaira Issa shows us frustration with the province is getting louder. You're all set. I'm ready to go. With his province's health care system on the verge of collapse, Saskatchewan's health minister sat down for his flu vaccine today. Given the pressures that we are seeing in our health care system, it is especially important this year. But with one of the lowest COVID vaccination rates in the country, he wants people to get the other jab as well. Unvaccinated COVID-19 patients are pushing Saskatchewan's resources to the brink. Surgeries and other medical services have been cancelled. Most of Saskatchewan's 135 ICU beds are full. Adults have even been admitted into pediatric wards. And with Canada's highest per capita rate of deaths, doctors are sounding alarm bells. We are really uh, one or two major car accidents away from a situation where people may not get the care that they really need. Despite the crisis, no new restrictions have been announced and Saskatchewan hasn't asked Ottawa for federal help. We're trying the same thing over and over again and we're expecting different results. This is insanity. The government is in talks with Ontario and Manitoba about potentially sending critical care patients out of province. But the health minister says Saskatchewan has enough workers to handle the load. They have uh, the resources in place to meet our needs. And if we get to a point where we can't be able to provide that quality of care, then we're going to look at other provinces to be able to assist us. The opposition leader called for the health minister to resign. Yeah. He's lying to Saskatchewan people and he's doing so in a way that will cost people their lives. It's hard to overstate how serious Saskatchewan's situation is. ICU nurses and respiratory therapists are in high demand, and healthcare staff that are available are in danger of burning out. Omera Issa, CBC News, Regina. Meanwhile, COVID-19 is still wreaking havoc next door to BC in Alberta. That province is leading Canada in active cases, and sadly today, 30 more people died from the disease. But pressure on that healthcare system is slowly easing, thanks in part to the generosity of healthcare workers from away. Julia Wong shows us how strong bonds forged in the oil patch are bringing East Coasters to Fort McMurray. Stepping up to help the Fort McMurray Hospital was a no-brainer for nurse practitioner Jennifer Richard. This is what I truly love to do. The Newfoundland and Labrador government sent her four registered nurses and two doctors to work mainly in Fort McMurray's overloaded ICU. There's a mix of COVID-19 patients and patients who have other diagnosis. Um, so we're, we are caring for any patient um, that might be in the ICU right now, regardless of their uh, diagnosis. Case numbers rose sharply in northern Alberta after the summer. Now ICU capacity is well above what it is normally. The government has flown patients down to larger hospitals in Edmonton. The additional hands mean room for two more patients, but the system is still on the brink. It will allow us to keep North Zone and Fort McMurray and the regional municipality would Buffalo patients closer to home. Uh, but yeah, we were, we were definitely um, in expansion, so uh, probably unsustainable in the longer term. Today, Premier Jason Kenney tweeted a letter of gratitude for the help to a province with deep ties to the city. Fort McMurray is well connected with Newfoundland. <clears throat> and so to me, it was, uh, it's an emotional aspect to it, I think. 
With a long history of oil sands workers from Newfoundland and Labrador, Fort McMurray is lovingly called the province's second largest city. A fact not lost here, the hospital hoisted the flag of Newfoundland and Labrador to welcome the new team. Some of our nurses uh, that are traveling on our team have family and friends that are here. Uh, we have some colleagues that are working here that we graduated nursing school with. For Richard, the call to help rang so loud, she deployed just days after getting married. We were able to have a wonderful honeymoon and I arrived here a couple days later than the team. Called to her duty as a nurse in a community so close to the heart of Newfoundlanders. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court of Canada has ordered a new trial for an Ontario man in connection with the death of another man in 2016. Peter Cahill testified he shot John Stiers in self-defense. He was acquitted of second-degree murder, but as Rafi Bujikanian tells us, the case is going back to court. Supreme Court has agreed with the Ontario Court of Appeal and therefore a retrial will take place in the shooting death of John Stiers. It happened in February 2016. Army reservist Peter Cahill is accused of shooting and killing Stiers. He had initially argued self-defense and gotten an acquittal from second-degree murder charges. The Crown had appealed that sentence. The Supreme Court has now agreed that the jury in the initial trial had not been properly instructed as to Cahill's conduct leading up to Steyer's death. Indigenous communities have been watching this case closely. Steyer's was from Oswekin, Ontario. His case echoed another that also happened in 2016, that of Colton Bushi, a youth from Red Pheasant Nation in Saskatchewan, who was shot and killed. Gerald Stanley had gotten an acquittal in that case. There'd been an outcry from Indigenous communities across Canada about the lack of visibly Indigenous jurors in the Stanley case. In this one, jurors were screened for racial bias, asked if Cahill being a white man and Stiers being an Indigenous man would affect their judgment in any way. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Ottawa. Police in Norway say a 37-year-old man has confessed to attacking people with a bow and arrows, killing five of them and wounding three more. Police do not have a motive yet, but say the deadly attack appears to be an act of terror. It happened last night in a town outside Oslo. The alleged attacker is Danish and is in jail. Police believe he was acting alone, along with a bow and arrow. Police say he suspect used other weapons, including a knife. At least 46 people are dead and dozens more hurt after a massive fire tore through a building in Taiwan. The blaze in the 13-story building was home to many seniors and low-income families. It's still not clear how many of the 120 units in the building were occupied. Investigators are now trying to figure out if it was arson. At least six people have been killed after the worst street violence in Beirut in more than a decade. As Margaret Evans shows us, a fierce political fight is behind that violence. Beirut today. A hollow rattle of bullets bouncing off buildings, sectarian militias exchanging fire, and people running for cover. My wife was hiding downstairs, but our neighbor was killed, says this man. She was shot in the head with a bullet. The shooting began during a protest organized by the militant Shia Muslim group Hezbollah against a judge investigating last year's huge explosion at the Beirut port. Hezbollah says snipers from a Christian faction known as the Lebanese forces started shooting at demonstrators, an accusation already denied. Video shows gunmen on the street with assault rifles and the thud of rocket-propelled grenades could be heard on residential streets, all shuddering reminders of Lebanon's long-ago civil war, still living close to the surface. I was 10 or 11 years old, says this shop owner. The same scene that was in my head as a kid, it's now repeating. It is yet another blow to Lebanon. 
Already on the brink of economic collapse, its ruling class is divided by sectarianism, but united in corruption. Investigation into the port explosion is expected to point to political negligence. Hezbollah wants the judge removed, accusing him of bias. Experts say today's violence may derail the investigation. So, so today they shot at the Hezbollah demonstration. Who says if tomorrow uh, you do a demonstration of a different politic in support of the judge, uh, maybe there will be snipers too. The Beirut explosion destroyed whole city blocks and killed more than 200 people last year when 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate stored at the port for years ignited. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Arctic world leaders are meeting in Iceland ahead of what many are calling a make or break climate change summit at the end of this month. They're talking about the future of the region in a warming world. That's next. It's 6 a.m. off Vancouver Island, and Gord Smith and his crew are at the Daily Catch. Oh, look at the shine on that, man. That's but it's not salmon or red snapper they're after. They don't grow in Japan like that. It's seaweed, and nowhere is it more popular than Japan. In sushi or in soup, it's a staple for one-third of the world's population. Smith is the first North American seaweed farmer. His dream began seven years ago when he met a Japanese businessman collecting the seaweed seeds in British Columbia. I started to think, well, if they're coming here to get the seed for it, it's got to grow here very well. So there has to be potential for an industry here. This slimy stuff is worth $25 million a year in North America alone. And in Asia, we're talking a major commodity, $3 billion and growing 15% every year. But cashing in on this crop isn't just a matter of raking it up off the beach and heading for your bank. Before the seaweed becomes an Asian breakfast, it has to be washed and toasted into sheets called nori. That takes more equipment and money than Smith has. And it didn't take him long to realize he had even a bigger problem. Selling nori to Asians is like taking coal to Newcastle. The seaweed market is controlled by a small number of Asian families. In North America, the biggest seaweed market is in San Francisco. A sale here will give Smith a tremendous boost. But he's about to find out being a newcomer among Asians who control the market yes. isn't yes. easy. Um, just wondered if I could have a few minutes of your time sure. and uh, show you some of the things that we've got here. J.B. Kimuro orders a million sheets of seaweed Sorry, from Asia every uh, year. But delivery is slow. Is our nori from Japan? Mm -hmm. It took me maybe three or four months already. If you order two or three or five pallets mm -hmm. in cases of 500, mm -hmm. that can be here the next day. Uh, of course, on the fresh from Los, I mean, from Canada, and the price is a reasonable <clears throat> price, no problem. What's a reasonable price? According to Japanese tradition, no one must lose face in this deal. So it's only after Smith leaves that Kimuro sends us a different signal. Smith's nori is too expensive. Okay. The price is very fancy too. So uh, I hope that he makes a number to grade. Then that's big market for us. I don't know. Thank you, sir. Thank you, much. Nori, used as sushi wrappers for raw fish, is big business in Asia and America. Smith sells his seaweed on the fact that it's grown in clean water and it's fresh. So to get the opinion of those who use the seaweed, we took Smith's nori to Sachio Kojima, the most acclaimed Japanese chef in San Francisco. Seaweed jerky. No smell, man. Not enough smell. Uh, to mouth. You wouldn't buy it? I don't buy it. <laughs> Here are some of the stories we're following tonight for you on CBC Vancouver News. We are intending this circuit breaker to save lives. We have thrown everything in but the kitchen sink. 
BC is tightening COVID restrictions even further in the north as it tries to stop the spread of the disease. As of midnight tonight, only fully vaccinated people can gather indoors and outdoors in already smaller groups, and worship services must be online only once again. The province says almost 60 patients had to be moved out of Northern Health to keep beds free, and officials say most of those patients have been very sick with COVID. We have no evidence to demonstrate there was a, an occurrence associated with railway operations. I'm very disappointed. I feel that it wasn't a thorough investigation. Months after that catastrophic fire wiped out the village of Lytton, the Transportation Safety Board says it has found no link between train activity and the blaze. But some villagers are very skeptical, noting the TSB did not interview any of them. The BC Wildfire Service and the RCMP are still looking into the fire. I'm so proud to be South Asian and I wouldn't want to be part of any other culture. Imagine redecorating your teenage bedroom today. It's not for everyone, but a Vancouver artist has done just that to reclaim some of her earlier years. Sandeep Johal has made South Asian role models far more prominent in the new space. And you can tour it at the Surrey Art Gallery. The BC government says it will spend $2 million to help a new plant in Merritt develop new fuels. The motorcycle rider, he was a, a Vancouver resident, a man. Mm -hmm. Apologies, that is the wrong clip. It will be maced in Merritt, as we said. And the energy minister, Bruce Ralston, says Squamish-based Huron Clean Energy will build and operate that plant. It'll capture carbon dioxide from the air and convert it into low-carbon synthetic fuels. The plant will be built on land leased from the Upper Nicola Band, which he says will have a large stake in that project. The giant UN climate change conference is coming up at the end of this month, with key goals and targets still unmet. So Arctic nations are meeting in Iceland for the Arctic Circle Assembly ahead of the crucial world gathering. Our Chris Brown is there and has more on what they hope to achieve. Iceland is bleak but beautiful and like other parts of the Arctic also in peril from a warming climate. This week Reykjavik is hosting Arctic nations and to drive home what's at stake, organizers put a melting block of glacial ice outside the venue. We who live in the high north we face storm clouds on the horizon because the Arctic as we know it is changing fast. And in the conference corridors, these Icelandic students told us the changes are impossible to miss. We have seen uh, multiple heat records uh, during this summer. There was a glacier called Auk, very close to where I grew up, and it doesn't exist anymore. It, it, it's just melted off the map. This Arctic Circle Assembly has become known as the Davos of the North, a forum to discuss big ideas for the future. But with the UN's climate conference now just two weeks away, the fear that nations will miss key climate targets is dominating the discussion. Many big polluting nations have not said how they intend to cut emissions and a $100 billion global financing package remains incomplete. Scotland's First Minister, who's hosting the COP26 meeting in Glasgow, implored countries to get it done. Climate change is the greatest challenge facing our planet and COP26 is our best chance to address it. Iceland may have a few innovations of its own. A delegation from Denmark visited a local plant that sucks carbon straight out of the atmosphere. The Danish foreign minister told us he believes richer nations must embrace new tech. The most cheapest way actually to produce electricity is to deploy wind turbines in Denmark uh, compared to building a new, for example, coal power plant. The Arctic is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world. The hope here this week is that it's still not too late to slow it down. Chris Brown, CBC News in Reykjavik, Iceland. A breakout Netflix hit has driven demand for a certain type of Korean treat. How a Montreal store owner is capitalizing on that hit show. And at 6.42, a live look at Whistler. The local mountains getting dusted with some snow while it rains down in the village. That freezing level will rise as the rain comes ashore on the coast. Johanna will tell us how much is coming after this.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join Gloria Makarenko at the 65 Roses Soiree, a virtual boutique experience in support of Cystic Fibrosis Canada. Get your tickets today at 65rosesgala.com. And the Hutzpah Festival of International Jewish Performing Arts returns with an exciting lineup of performances, including dance, music, theatre and more. Visit chutzpahfestival.com for more info. Move over firefighters, the Vancouver Police dog calendars are getting tails wagging. The annual fundraiser hopes to raise half a million dollars for charity. All we need to do is sell 3,500 calendars. Very easily done, but we need your help. The calendar features all 16 of the VPD doggos at famous landmarks across the city. So in 2022, expect to see the Copper Canines at the Convention Centre, the Peony and Grouse Mountain, amongst other places. Calendars are available online and in person at the VPD headquarters and community policing centers. All those proceeds benefit the BC Cancer Foundation and the BC Children's Hospital Foundation. They're good dogs. They get the job done. Don't want one of them going after me. And I will They're be They're very good dogs. They are. Yes. And, yes, they are. And I should say, Dan, that my Rodney dog has mm -hmm. already ordered his calendar he's got well, a, I hope so. he's got his eye on february he so, may be uh, in the top three of best dogs let's be fair even <laughs> when he interrupts is he there no he's not hmm. he's uh he's waiting he's checking postage on the calendar i think right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah all of his other amazon purchases smart dog yeah exactly another ring at the doorbell i know who it's for <laughs> another bone yeah uh all right i better get us to the forecast i know he's he's watching that closely as well it's gonna really hinder our walk uh, but before I get to the rain that I know we've been uh, talking lots about, let's start you off with the current temperatures because it's been chilly this month, as we keep saying. We have yet to hit 15 degrees this October, 10 right now uh, at YVR. We are going to see temperatures warm up a little bit as we really get into this Pineapple Express that's knocking on the door right now. Uh, 75 to 150 millimeters, just to remind everyone that's tomorrow morning through to Sunday morning, and Metro Vancouver is in the bullseye. So let's get you through that timing. We are seeing scattered showers. Some of those showers were heavier today across Metro Vancouver, but look, 3, 4, 5 a.m., the yellows start to appear in my forecast rainfall. Those are the heavy rounds of rain, and it doesn't stop there. Uh, oranges, the very heavy tomorrow afternoon, looking at pockets of very heavy rain across Metro Vancouver. We don't see much of a break between pulses of moisture. Friday evening, uh, things are going to get heavy again. Uh, and right through to Saturday, we really don't see a break from the heavy to very heavy rain across Metro Vancouver. So if you can get out tonight, uh, even tomorrow morning after the rain event has started and clear those storm drains, uh, just take a little extra time if you're out on the roads, pooling, localized flooding, all a concern uh, with the kind of rainfall that we're seeing. It will make its way over towards the interior, but uh, showers at best for the southern interior through the day. That'll get to uh, Cranbrook by the time we hit uh, Saturday. But generally, the south coast taking that bullseye. Uh, there are the, there's the warm-up in temperatures for Saturday and Sunday. Watching the Sunday forecast closely, I know it would be nice if we had some weekend. Uh, Sunday afternoon, there is still hope it'll clear out a little earlier. Monday, Tuesday, well, we, we will need that Monday by mm -hmm. the time the next three days <laughs> are done. Uh, we've never, never wanted a Monday so badly, I think. Yeah, but I remember two months ago when it was so bloody hot, we needed rain. Remember that, Joe? There's always two sides to the weather coin. Indeed, Indeed. especially amidst <laughs> climate change. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't well know said. if you saw this last night, but this may be one of the nicest goals anybody's ever seen from Canada's Alfonso Davies. Okay. Chance to counter. This time it's Buchanan forward. David plays it down the line. Look how that ball stay in, and Davies is on it. Davies takes it away. 2v1. Davies has Buchanan. Alfonso Davies. Keeps it himself! Goal! Alfonso Davies, are you kidding me? No, we're not. Good Lord, going right that after was, goal. Yeah. It was like, he stripped the defense of the ball. The ball was almost out. He managed to flick it out. Here it is. Let's get a little closer. Wait for it. Whoom. You know, anyone could do that, said no one ever. Fans in Toronto losing their minds. It was a packed house for that game. Canada beat Panama 4-1 in World Cup qualifying. 
Let's just keep watching it. Head coach John Herdman comparing Davies to Canada's greatest soccer player, Christine Sinclair, saying, like her, very humble he is and influential and leads by example. No kidding. Wow. Amazing. Did you get to watch that live? Uh, no, but lots of repeats. Just oh, yeah. keep them coming. Amazing. Awesome. Exactly. Yeah, that's one we're going to be talking about for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're not watching uh, the, uh, I mean, there's still a lot of levels to go. So a lot of games. If you're not watching those, you're probably watching, oh, I don't know, the new Korean drama Squid Game mm -hmm. that uh, has made it the most popular show on Netflix. Uh, I've, I'm guilty as charged of also watching it. Uh, but it's also led to a growing hunger for Delgana, a treat featured on the show. And as Rowan Kennedy shows us, that's good news for a Montreal convenience store owner. Robert Kim owns a depanar in Saint-Henri, and he's added something new to his shelves. Dalgona, a sugar-based cookie from Korea. It's a treat that reminds him of a game he played with the treat there as a child. So after the class, me and my, my friends or the classmates went together, we played a game, we enjoyed the game, Cutting Shapes Out of Dalgana, is featured in an episode of Netflix's smash hit, Squid Game. On the show, contestants have to compete for their lives and for money to erase their debt. It's Netflix's most popular show in at least 90 countries, so Kim decided to start selling them over the weekend. He says it was difficult finding the right recipe. At the beginning, we throw out a lot because you need uh, like a specific technique, like a special temperature control wise, it was very hard. In the first hour at the cash register, he says they sold out. It helps that teenagers from the high school across the street drop by. And it wasn't hard to find plenty of opinions about the show in the neighborhood. It was honestly good, but I don't really understand like the massive hype around it. I feel like it's actually a great show, but also a messed up show at the same time. Like a different culture and someone ref something refreshing from what we see all the time. We got the kimchi. Meanwhile, Kim says he's adding Dalgona to his collection of Korean delicacies. After 30 years, I got the chance to show people what Korea is about. He says Korean food is gaining in popularity, and he says the Dalgona are here to stay. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Montreal. It's very, very spiritual. It really means something. I think it makes you go inside a little bit more and most of our days are outside. We don't go inside and let our feelings come from the inside out. And that certainly made me do that today. Hi, my name is Chris LeMessure. I'm responsible for planning and design with the Grand Concourse Authority and we've uh, had the pleasure of assisting the Barring Park Foundation and the City of St. John's in the development of our new labyrinth here in Barring Park. Simply put, a labyrinth is a unencumbered path uh, that spirals uh, from the outside inward to a center point. The idea is to take the journey and to, to contemplate uh, along the way. Hi, my name is Louise Hostens. I'm Susan Davis. Well, my sister passed away five days ago, and I felt as I was going around the labyrinth that I really could feel her in my heart. It was very meditative, and I did it in her memory and hope that she is finally at peace. Just does give you that time of peace and reflection, a chance to do that. Whereas in the, the world is so um, active and boisterous and, and you, you really didn't have the time to reflect. And the labyrinth is a chance to do that. There's something about a labyrinth, it sort of takes you out of yourself and it, it gives you an awareness of the day. I was sick there in, in, in June and I had a, had a kidney cancer, I had a kidney removed. I'm a person now who lives every moment and every day at a time. I do feel, I honestly feel that some of the stresses of 
prior days and, and today, they, they sort of leave you because you just let it take it out of your body sort of thing. I don't know, I don't know with mind over matter, I'm not really sure, you know. I just know it's a good experience and, and, and I enjoy it. A Newfoundland couple made quite the scene earlier this week when they moved their two-story wooden house on water. Bit of a delicate operation. Take a look. Something that I always loved and dreamed of, of owning. And it's just, I don't know, it's the, it was the little greenhouse on the point that I just, I loved it. I talked about it to my friends, my family. Everybody knew that I always... My heart always belonged to this house. And now that I was given the opportunity to take it and move it to our own location and make it our own family home is is more than I could ever dreamed of. It was being torn down. So instead of it being torn down, we just said, well, take it and make it a make the best of it. See if it can withstand the water and if if it's meant to be over there, it's meant to be. And according to yesterday, it was meant to be. My father moved lots of houses on land. So we knew that when I asked him, he said, yep, it can be definitely be done. And Kirk's brother, Kiri, we asked him, he floated a little boathouse out to his cabin, Bright's Cove. So we talked to him about it and he said, yep, everything, you know, you just got to get the barrels. You got to get all your stuff lined up, jack her up. And, and do everything and then put her in the water and try it. <laughs> For me, I wished I was like the bystanders who got to watch it, not witnessing your house coming across the bay and wondering if it was gonna be at the bottom or it was gonna make it the whole way. We had a couple obstacle courses, but it went very smoothly and we're glad that now we have a beautiful home over there and the community supported us and my, our family, our friends. We are so thankful for everybody. And don't have to sing under the sea. You can always find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock tonight with Zara Premji after the National. Thanks for joining us.